Okay, great. I guess we can, guess we can get started. So first off, thanks everybody uh, for joining. Uh, my name is Eric Sachs. Uh, I'm one of the engineering directors at Oracle. Uh, I work in the systems division and I'm responsible for our efforts around our Solaris-based OpenStack distribution. Vikas, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, and I'm, uh, my name is Vikas Birkes, um, and I work in the Oracle OpenStack for Oracle Linux distribution, um, also for Oracle. Great. So we've been um, working on OpenStack for quite some time. Um, I'm trying to remember if this is what our f what fifth or sixth um, OpenStack summit. I think the first one that we joined was um, the Portland summit, which was quite some time ago. I think there was a grand total of what, like three of us. And so I think in total, we probably have around 50 or 60 Oracle people here. Um, there's actually quite a lot of work happening around OpenStack um, across Oracle, across our uh, product portfolio, uh, on the system side, on the application side, on the storage side. Um, so we'd certainly invite you to stop by our booth. It's uh, A2 kind of on the left as you come inside the expo. And you can um, uh, see some demos and hear about uh, the various areas across Oracle where we're working on OpenStack. So um, when thinking about what we wanted to talk about this go around, um, you know, one of, I think, our real passionate areas is as we work with our customers, as you can imagine, many large-scale uh, large uh, traditional enterprise customers, how can we really help accelerate their adoption of cloud? And it's something um, that we find that many of our customers are very excited about. Um, I think the good news from our perspective, just about every customer that we talk to um, aspires to move to cloud-based management of their infrastructure. Um, they clearly understand the benefits of, of doing that, um, the agility that they see, um, um, you know, everything they stand to gain from being able to manage their infrastructure, compute, storage, and networking as a cohesive system and be able to have all that be software defined and really reduce the amount of time it takes between actually needing infrastructure and being able to leverage all of the automation that OpenStack has to offer uh, in order to be, be able to get that as quickly as possible. Um, so many of our, our, our customers are very interested in that. And in, a, in the recent survey that Taligent put out their state of the OpenStack report, um, the data that they find um, is actually pretty consistent with our findings. So the nice thing is if you look at this pie chart, 30% um, of uh, the survey respondents that they, they spoke with, and they, they surveyed uh, a pretty wide range of group across virtualization and cloud about how they're um, understanding or using OpenStack. So 30% of the folks that they talked to are actually using it to support production workloads, another 30% were, were evaluating it, and another 36% were, were familiar with it, though not yet using it, and only a very tiny slice of that pie, 2%, had never heard about it at all. And um, this, this is actually pretty common for us as well. Um, one of the things that we see when we talk with our customer base, which may be a little bit different sample set than this, is um, you know, if we ask folks in the audience you know, who's who's heard of OpenStack, nearly every hand in the audience goes up. Uh, but when we um, then ask the next question, who's actually been successful deploying OpenStack and, and, and doing that successfully, there, there's quite a different response. You know, maybe you know, half or less of those hands that went up um, actually do so. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can really improve that, how we can accelerate adoption uh, within the enterprise. And so, you know, some of the common things that we find, one of the biggest things is that still um, deploying an OpenStack cloud uh, really isn't easy. Um, deploying a single node OpenStack cloud really isn't that difficult. Things like DevStack make this very easy. I think nearly every uh, vendors out there offers a really quick and easy way, including Oracle, to evaluate OpenStack, you know, be able to take um, and deploy like a single VM or a single node, um, take that for a spin, see what it's like. But there's a huge difference between uh, that solution and what it actually takes to roll out a production scale uh, OpenStack cloud. And um, what our customers find is even if they have some familiarity of uh, OpenStack's architecture, they understand what Nova, Neutron, Cinder, all of these services do, there's a huge amount of expertise that they have to gain and understand in order to be able to sec successfully go and actually deploy and operate a production scale cloud. And I think one of the things that's helped um, certainly make this easier 
is many, uh, many vendors are offering um, cloud installers that simplify the process of doing uh, a multi-node installation. Uh, but even these come with you know, their own sets of challenges. In some case, you know, they make the initial job of deploying the cloud easy, but they may not handle the complete things from um, you know, being able to do upgrade or lifecycle management. They may not provide the tooling that's necessary for, for, for being able to operationally manage the cloud. Um, and you know, with the things that we find about clouds is, in many cases, they're like snowflakes. The, the architecture that might be right for one customer might be entirely different for another customer, depending on what their um, requirements are. So deploying it is um, um, you know, a certain amount of deployment complexity that there is to, to overcome there. And then in the context of you know, a large, truly scalable cloud, um, you know, we get asked, well, what does it take to actually deploy a cloud um, that's highly available um, and that can scale from you know, one node to many hundreds to many thousands of nodes? And then you start getting into realizing, well, this isn't just you know, my three, three node OpenStack cloud of my control plane, my compute, and my storage. That may be an okay start just to sort of evaluate this. But if I truly wanna have something that's gonna be highly available, and I truly wanna have something that um, will scale as my load scales, you really start, need to start looking at OpenStack's under cloud services, um, more like microservices, um, and deploying them out in a scale-out fashion, maybe making use of load balancers. Um, um, and it, it gets to be quite a bit more, um, certainly quite a bit more sophisticated. And many of the existing installers uh, that are out there, of course, um, you know, don't have this level of, of sophistication yet. So, um, so, there's, so there's sort of this trade-off that exists where on one hand, um, you know, if you have a cloud with, um, that's relatively simple to deploy, um, you know, that's easy from the deployment stage, but then later on, it's, it's hard to scale that up, and you may run into barriers there. On the other hand, if you wanna start planning through this from the very beginning and deploying a cloud that's gonna um, be solid from an operational perspective, well, there's a lot of initial uh, deployment complexity that uh, has to be overcome there. And just along the way, um, another piece of feedback that uh, we frequently hear is there just isn't um, the availability of tools that are necessary for understanding as I'm trying to go and configure this and something goes wrong, how do I diagnose what, what actually went wrong? How do I trace that back? Um, you know, there's just sort of a lot of anecdotal expertise that we find um, our customers have to, to come up to speed with and you know, it, the documentation doesn't always uh, necessarily have all of, uh, all of the right answers. So again, looking back at what Taligen found in its uh, State of the OpenStack report, um, some of the things that we're hearing from our customers indeed show up here, uh, lack of deployment tools, lack of tools for uh, enabling folks to effectively operate the cloud. How do you go about defining a security model uh, that makes sense? So um, you know, out of the box, it meets your needs around compliance, um, things like that. So the, these, I think, are very, um, very common concerns, but very real concerns for uh, folks in the enterprise, and, and I think to some extent may contribute to why um, there's sort of a drag for adoption uh, for, for many of our enterprise customers. And the other thing, too, um, that we've certainly identified, and even in the previous um, talk, I noticed HP made reference to this as well. Um, you know, OpenStack, when you look at the set of things that are enterprise customers run, um, and you look at the workload architectures, many of the workloads that are considered mission critical were designed some time ago, and they have very specialized needs uh, around the infrastructure that they run on. In fact, many of these workloads were actually designed along with the infrastructure um, to, to actually host them. So you know, now, when you're, um, as an enterprise customer, when you have many of these applications and you really want to move them all into the cloud, how do you effectively do this when um, the app and the infrastructure were baked together? Does your cloud really provide the infrastructure that it needs to effectively uh, run those applications? And so this is where um, you know, talking about apps as cattle versus pets um, certainly tends to come up. And you know, OpenStack certainly seems to do very, very well for um, these cattle-type applications where you know, they're sort of designed to be cloud-native from the beginning. Um, they're designed to scale out. Um, they 
Um, they're very resilient in that if one of the virtual machines dies or even one of the, the physical nodes dies, um, that VM is effectively stateless and so it can spin up. Um, but the reality is, is that um, many of the enterprise applications were designed such that they actually trust the underlying infrastructure. And so it's very um, critical for these workloads that that infrastructure can meet um, the needs of the workload. So, this, and again, this is one of the things that they highlighted is that, um, you know, their forecast is that OpenStack should be able to handle, um, you know, just about any workload in short order with, um, with the exception of pets. So it's, um, it's obviously a pretty uh, key focus area for us. Uh, Oracle um, um, invests quite heavily in the infrastructure that runs many uh, enterprise mission critical workloads. And so one of our key focus areas is looking how can we bring the kind of infrastructure that traditional enterprise workloads need into the context of OpenStack so that, um, so that customers don't have to choose um, between one or another. And there's actually a lot of very, very interesting work uh, that still needs um, to be done here. Uh, one of the things we're thinking about is, you know, how can we allow workloads um, to specify, you know, metadata about, you know, more data, data about what they actually need from the underlying work uh, infrastructure so that quality of service can be specified. Um, many of these things that these workloads were able to take for granted when they're running on dedicated infrastructure, they actually need to specify this information running in the context of cloud so that the underlying infrastructure um, can provide that and make these workloads run uh, the way that they, um, they were designed to run. So a lot of work to be, um, to be done there. Um, and just as an example, a few years back, Toby Ford uh, from AT&T, I think was uh, speaking during one of, the, one of the keynote summits in Atlanta, and he mentioned that um, they had found quite a, quite a bit of success with OpenStack. They were able to bring many of their workloads uh, over into the context of OpenStack Cloud, but you know, the reality is that um, these sorts of pet workloads uh, have to be handled and have to be managed. Um, and certainly for us, this is um, one of the challenges we've undertaken. What can we be building into the underlying cloud infrastructure to better cater to the needs uh, of these workloads? So um, I was looking around the time that I was doing this presentation, I was thinking about uh, OpenStack, since we have been working on this for some time now, and thinking about, you know, I really love um, Gartner's hype cycle. And if you haven't seen this before, really kind of what this describes is for any generic technology, uh, the cycle that it goes through. So obviously in the very beginning, um, the technology is gonna solve world hunger. Everybody gets very excited about it. Uh, lots of investment around it. So the hype and certainly all the expectations rise very quickly, um, but many of those expectations are overblown. And as folks sort of sort of realize this, there's what's called the trough of disillusionment, which I think is a really um, uh, accurate but um, you know somewhat humorous term. Uh, and then over time, um, you know, indeed, as the underlying technology continues to mature, and folks have expectations um, um, set more in line with where the technology is, and they both sort of catch up. Uh, over time, you, you pull out of this trough. And um, you know, there's more, there's more and more productivity. So, um, one of the things I was, um, I have sort of a rough idea of where I think OpenStack is on this cycle. How many folks in the audience think that we are, let's see, somewhere on the um, left side of the peak of inflated expectations for OpenStack? You, David, you think we're on the left side of peak inflated expectations? Anyone else? How many folks think we're on the right side of the peak of inflated expectations for OpenStack? Okay, well there's only two sides and not everybody raised their hands, so. Um, I actually think that, you know, and, and maybe, maybe this is different by, um, by sector. I, I tend to think we're, we're coming out of the trough of disillusionment. Um, I think that um, this may account for you know, what many of, one of our customers are telling us, they're obviously all very familiar with OpenStack, uh, but I think it's taken time for them to get familiar with it and get an understanding of today uh, where it works really, really well, um, but also getting an understanding of where more investment is really needed uh, in order for um, them to find more uh, success with it in the, in the enterprise. Um, so I think, that, I think that we're coming out of it, but there's definitely 
um, more work to do. And so focusing on some of those areas we, we just talked about, I think, are going to be key for that. So this is really what we're focused on is, you know, what if we could actually invest in building a cloud, uh, a better cloud infrastructure um, that's easier to deploy and manage. So, you know, we can not only do a really good job of handling, um, you know, cattle and cloud native workloads, but can also effectively meet um, the diverse work workload mix um, that exists in the enterprise today. So, so that's a lot of what we're focused on. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the specifics for um, what we have and what we've been doing in this area on the, on the Solaris side, and then Vegas will talk um, certainly about um, some of those same things on the, on the Linux side as well. Um, as we've been looking at our strategy in Solaris around OpenStack, uh, one of the key things is how can we take advantage of many of the native uh, features and technologies uh, that Solaris has to offer, and certainly what are the things that are most critical to um, enterprise customers. And clearly, security and compliance is one of those things that's, um, that's top of the list. Um, so in our OpenStack distribution, um, some of the work that we've done, all of OpenStack's under cloud services will run with the least amount of privilege necessary for them to get the job done, so nothing runs, down, um, nothing runs as root. Um, we also have some features in the OS that um, effectively allow you to lock down um, um, both VMs and um, effectively the host environment uh, with a feature called immutability. So the nice thing about this is it basically allows you to treat your cloud, um, your under cloud infrastructure as, as an appliance. And you know, really this is the way you should be treating it. You really don't want administrators to be logging into your production cloud environment and making changes in your control plane. Once it's actually set and it's working, uh, you want to lock it down and it, and it should be an immutable environment. So the nice thing is even, you know, it's nice that we have the services running with the least amount of privilege necessary. Even if somebody were able to break into the system, um, they wouldn't be able to make any changes that could compromise the environment because the environment is effectively read only at that point. Uh, and we have some specific profiles that we've actually introduced specifically for um, the um, Nova Compute node, for example, that, um, that take advantage of this. Uh, all of OpenStack we have delivered via the, the image packaging system. Um, so we have all the dependencies expressed, all of the, the services run as SMF services. Um, so there's automated service restart and dependencies that exist between services. Um, we make heavy use of ZFS uh, within Solaris. So the nice thing about this is um, it's very easy to roll back um, if um, you know, something were to go wrong in the process of an upgrade or, or something happens. It's very easy to snap off a new uh, ZFS-based boot environment so you can instantly roll back to the, uh, to the functioning environment. And that's all very integrated with the packaging system. And then overall, uh, our OpenStack distribution, so um, using this, you can um, provide tenants access to Spark environments, x86 environments, uh, virtualized via Solera zones and, and kernel zones, and then also um, bare metal via Ironic as well. And so just, just pretty much graphically captures a lot of, uh, a lot of what I described in the, various, what, in the various Solaris technologies that we are, um, that we are building on top of. And then obviously ZFS is, um, is a huge um, differentiating technology that we build across. Uh, we ship the Cinder driver for the ZFS storage appliance. Um, so that's integrated. Um, it's actually possible too, if you have a just a generic system that's storage rich with a bunch of disks, you can put those disk, disks in a ZFS Z pool. You can run Cinder and then um, you can basically hand out uh, LUNs over uh, iSCSI um, just from a, um, a generic box. And then the nice thing about that is you're, you're still leveraging ZFS underneath the hood, so that gives you, you know, snapshots, compression, encryption, um, you know, all those features are available to you, but um, um, you know, provisioned to Nova instances via Cinder. So I'll hand it over to Vikas to talk more about uh, uh, the Linux-based distribution. Is it on? There we go. 
Um, so for the Linux side, uh, we, we've spent a lot of time, so we, we started long after the Solaris group starting to do the Linux distro for OpenStack. Um, and we, we, we came along for a while and we, we decided that we quickly realized that the standard for all the private cloud infrastructure is going to be OpenStack. Um, and that's going to be the way that most customers and most people will end up managing the data center resources as a cloud using the um, OpenStack. Uh, we also, from day one, decided we need to support all the um, hypervisors that Oracle in the Linux the side of the house have, so like OVM and KVM. Um, and we wanted to support a, a heterogeneous infrastructure like with the Docker containers. So to give you a simple overview of what we have today and what we support is like on the Nova side, you can see this KVM, Oracle VM server. We also support Hyper-V as a, as a tech preview. Um, so you can actually contain, um, run Hyper-V as well. Um, the, one, the one interesting point which, is, which I want to talk about is on the right, the MySQL cluster. So we do not ship the Galera cluster like everyone else. We actually opted to do the MySQL cluster. Um, which we find is a lot more scalable and a lot more manageable than the Galera cluster. So for our distro, we spend a lot of time getting the MySQL cluster working and correctly integrated into the Oracle OpenStack for Oracle Linux. So to give you a quick overview of how this actually works, since um, the Oracle Linux distribution for OpenStack is all Docker-based. So um, it gives you just this, if you take a look at the picture, we start with the OpenStack Docker images that we um, ship to you and soon they will all be available on the Oracle container registry. So you can get them directly from, the, from Oracle. Um, we, do supply, we do suggest people use a local Docker registry to cache them. Um, I don't think everyone wants to open up all the Nova um, nodes to the internet. Um, and then you have a, a very simple tool that we sort of wrote on top of the, uh, the container um, technology which we use, which is also OpenStack upstream for the OpenStack Cola project. I'll, I'll mention, talk about it in a minute. And it, it's, once you configure it, you just hit deploy, and it actually deploys to all the nodes automatically. It's actually pretty uh, fascinating seeing how it works. So containerizing OpenStack, what does it really mean? So OpenStack has, as everyone knows, many, 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 many services. Um, we started with the base services, the dev core services, and we picked um, the OpenStack Cola project to how to, to really use that to start containerizing this. Um, each service, for instance, have one or more containers as well. It's like Nova have the API, the scheduler conductor. Um, so when you start doing this in containerized, you end up using a lot of containers. Um, Nova, I think, ends up being four or five containers. Um, so it's, it ends up being like hundreds of containers that you start having to ship with this product to actually deploy it. And that presents a brand new problem, right? So you went from 100 or 200 RPMs to 100 or 200 containers. So you have to manage that. So what does it buy you, right? You just move the pro, it's like, it looks like you're moving the ball around. It's like, okay, add to RPMs, that had issues, now we move it to containers that have this other issue that we have to manage all these containers. Well, what it ended up being is, since we're breaking up the OpenStack services in these microservices, the Docker containers, we can now start deploying this stuff as uni atomic units, right? So you can now deploy any service on its own, and it doesn't affect any other service. One of the, the bigger problems that, we run, that you run into if you do this with an RPM, which we had initially, is when you upgrade Cinder, it upgrades a bunch of packages that requires Nova to upgrade at the same time, which requires Horizon to upgrade. So you had this whole, you, you touch one service and everything else had to upgrade because of the interdependencies between them. So the, with the Docker containers, we can sidestep that. Since we have all that, that um, cont uh, dependencies inside the containers, we can now start upgrading container by container by container, or service by service. 
Um, so the, the patches we do is uh, we up, upstream the patches as well for all of these. And it's reliable and fast to deploy. Since these containers are immutable, we don't actually carry any data in the container, you can repeat the deployment process. You can blow everything away and repeat this deployment and it will look exactly the same as the previous time. So Kola, so as I said, I'll mention Kola. What is it? It is an OpenStack product, project. Um, it's in the big tent. Uh, we started very early on contributing to Kola. Um, it's one of, our, one of our engineers is actually a core, a core reviewer for Kola project. And when we started down the road of dockerizing, we initially started doing it ourselves. And when we heard about the Kola project, we started working with them directly and started contributing upstream. Um, so Kola pr pr provides you with two things today. Once, one is the Docker containers, and one is Ansible playbooks to actually deploy these called Docker containers. Um, and that was help a lot. I mean, it actually, well, for us being contributing, to contribute all that code upstream helps everyone in the long run because one of our big goals is not to help just us. We want to help the whole OpenStack community. So everything we're doing in Kola, we're contributing upstream. Anything we're doing on Cinder or whatever, we contribute upstream. We really want to be, help the OpenStack community as, at large. One of the other big focus areas for us um, is the Oracle products, right? So um, Oracle would want to actually have a way for you to use OpenStack and the Oracle products. So early on, we decided that we need to be able to do a, like a building block structure. So we looked around at all the products and we looked at Murano. So one of the things that's nice about Murano is we can really start doing building blocks. So with the, dat the database is actually, we will um, release a tech preview for the database Murano application um, very soon. And once that's out, and it uses all the Oracle standard templates that we had for Oracle VM in the past, so they're very well tested, very well known. Um, uh, they've been, actually, people have been deploying for over five years, these this templates, right? So we actually have them tuned to a very well. And it allows us now to, when we have the database, now the next step is now we can start building the next application, right? So we can now start building the whole Red Stack up. Like what everyone is asking us is like, when, are, when is a Red Stack going to be on OpenStack? Well, this is the start of that, right? We, but we have to start with the database. We have to start at the bottom, start building up. And with Murano, you'll see with the database 12, we actually have a demo running in a booth for this. So come by and see it, um, and I can, we'll show you how actually we can build the stack up. So a quick update on the release. Um, Oracle Linux for, or will release uh, version 3.0 later this year. Um, it will, it's Metaka based. Um, and it's really focused uh, this time around, we are focusing on the Murano and the heat integration for the database. We are adding a couple of services as tech previews, Magnum and Ironic. Um, so we have we had a lot of requests for people who want to play with um, Kubernetes and uh, containers, so we, we're going to do a tech preview for Magnum, and it's still going to be released this quarter. So look out for that. Do it you. Switching back. Okay. Great. So I'll, I'll spend the last few minutes talking about some some of our um, work in progress as well. So we are also in the process of. Um, building out a cloud installer manager for, um, for doing automated uh, multi-node OpenStack installation. Um, so this is something that we're very, very excited about. You know, basically the idea is it makes it super easy to take um, some infrastructure systems and be able to designate and assign them as um, you know, controller node or for hosting VMs or for you know, designating uh, certain nodes or a, a ZFS storage appliance, for example, for cloud storage, and you know, having all the automation take place in order to implement best practice for those and actually build out um, uh, a ready-to-go OpenStack cloud. Um, and certainly, you know, this is something we're going to continue to invest in as we roll out uh, more and more uh, best practices for um, doing scale-out and high availability. Um, so this is something that um, um, is, has actually come quite 
far along, and um, you know we we have some demos around this in our uh, booth in the in the expo hall, and certainly by the time the next uh, show comes around, we'll probably have a lot more uh, to show about this as well. Um, and then also along the lines of database as a service integration, uh, we've also been um, engaging quite a bit with the Trove community. Um, so we've been working uh, a good bit with the uh, with the Tesora folks and also with Marantis. Uh, one of our focus areas of discussion is really around a reference architecture uh, for database as a service. So if a cloud administrator wants to roll out a uh, Trove-based database as a service, um, you know, what's sort of the best practices architecture for what this looks like so that it's secure, it's effectively multi-tenant. Um, so this is, um, this is um, also some very exciting work in progress um, this Thursday. At 1.15, uh, Thanu and uh, Amaranth from Tesora will be talking a little bit about the reference uh, architecture work, so I certainly encourage folks who are interested uh, to join that as well. Um, and then um, if for folks who are interested in learning more about our OpenStack offerings on the Solaris side, on the Linux side, uh, a couple of helpful URLs as well. Um, you know, uh, our, our source code is also something that we um, are very keen to contribute upstream. Um, so um, we've been doing quite a bit of that lately. Um, all of our, our source code, whether or not it's you know, completely made it upstream yet, is, uh, is available on java.net for folks who are interested in taking a look at our, um, our Nova driver, our Cinder drivers and whatnot. Um, so those are available there. And um, I think with that, that might be it. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Anybody has any questions they'd like to ask? It looks like there's mics sit up on the side of the room. Yes. Well, yeah, no, so this is, um, and this is something that um, is being offered on uh, mm -hmm. the Linux side. It's something we're also working on for Solaris. Um, Oracle, um, MySQL is actually part of Oracle as well. Um, so um, it, it seems like a pretty natural point of extension because so much of OpenStack natively uses MySQL. So it's kind of a logical extension to be able to take advantage of MySQL cluster in that context because when you want to roll out a database, uh, when you want to roll out a cloud architecture that's highly available, the database is actually one of the most critical pieces to get right. And it's really, really nice, I think, to be able to take advantage of MySQL cluster in that context so you can have you know, an active, active uh, solution there. So you know, because of the fact that OpenStack you know, already takes advantage so well of MySQL, MySQL cluster seemed like a natural extension. Could we, in the future, you know, do more and add support for other, uh, uh, other things? That's certainly possible, but that's what we're doing right now. Any, anything else you want to say on that, Vikas? Uh, yeah, and I mean, and one of the things that is on the roadmap is to um, look at add, adding Oracle as a backend. Mm -hmm. um, we are looking at that, but it will be a much more longer term project. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hard coding done in OpenStack for the database. A lot. A lot. Yeah. I mean, um, I, we, were, we were actually very surprised to see just how much hard coding there is around InnoDB. Yeah. Just the InnoDB, it's like within MySQL, the InnoDB engine, so, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, a bit of question, so you're talking about Kala, and you're talking about shipping your own uh, containers for OpenStack. Mm -hmm. So the main problem with the whole approach of containers in OpenStack is the compute part. So uh, it doesn't really do a good job to uh, containerize the Nova scheduler, because you have to work with uh, so, um, so what we did is um, on the on the Nova side, on the compute side, well, we actually use libvirt, right? So, like Nova normally uses libvirt, that's containerized and it talks directly. So we don't try to containerize the schedule, uh, the hypervisor directly, right? You containerize everything above that, anything that's OpenStack, and the libvirt would be the last piece that you would call part of the OpenStack piece, right? Libvirt will then talk directly to the hypervisor. And it works pretty well. I mean, we, can, we don't have any, the bigger problem we had was actually getting Oracle VM in there as well, right? Because Oracle VM is then 
very little of the community is actually testing Zen. So that took us much longer time than the KVM stuff. KVM was like working out of the box directly upstream from Kola. And yeah, it works, it works fine. We don't see any issues. Gentlemen, the mic. Yeah. Um, can you share some details about your scale numbers? Uh, not, not just the compute scale, but even your networking scale and um, what issues you hit and how you solve them. <laughs> Me? <laughs> networking scale, neutron, the north-south is always the problem, right? The network node. Um, so currently we are looking at multiple options there. We haven't, I would say, we haven't solved the problem. I don't know if anyone can really come out and say they solved the problem. Um, but the north-south, is the east-west, is the DVR works fine. We've tested it, and it, that's okay. But north-south, still with the network node, is a problem. So we are looking at a couple of partners to work with to see how we can solve that. Um, maybe with EVPN and Arista and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I think the things that we found is that the nice thing is that most of OpenStack's under cloud architecture seem to, seems to lend itself fairly well to, um, to being scaled out. Uh, you know, provided you have the stateful parts of the architecture uh, appropriately implemented with, you know, something like MySQL cluster or uh, something for that. But for a lot of the rest of it, um, you know, um, you can't take advantage of scale-out architectures for that. The big trade-off, of course, is then you have something that's pretty um, complex um, to manage and operate and lifecycle manage. And so that's where that trade-off kind of seems to play out. Linux. Mm. Oracle Linux. Oracle Linux, yeah. How would you, just one sentence, position one to the other, the enterprise one? They're both awesome. How would you do it? I mean, one would be more for data based applications, one would be more for what? It's something that can't, I, don't, I, I really don't believe can be appropriately captured in, in a single sentence, right? Because there's just such a, there's a lot of diversity on both sides of the fence around technology and technology integration. Um, you know, the other question is like what sorts of other, you know, components in the ecosystem are, are going to be used, you know, vendor ISV availability, um, you know, depth of integration with the hardware portfolio. I mean, there's just, there's many, many dimensions and it's impossible to sort of capture that. I think the best thing to do would be to take a step back and think about what it is that you're going to be deploying, what applications you're going to be running, what do you already have in the environment, and start to approach it that way to think about you know, what might be the appropriate you know, technologies and tools to be leveraged. It's really hard to say you know, just off the cuff, yeah, you should use this tool or, or that tool. Other questions? All right, well. Oh. pet applications that are troublesome in OpenStack? Yeah, I mean, things that would be, you know, applications that um, would already be taking advantage of, um, you know, something like uh, cluster for maintaining high availability in the environment. Um, maybe things today that, um, you know, are very performance sensitive and you've, you've built out the infrastructure, it requires, you know, quality of service. Maybe you're have deep integration with the hardware that you're using to guarantee that quality of service. And then the real question is, is in the context of an OpenStack environment, can you provide that application the, um, in you know, that same environment? And how easy is it to make that software defined? Um, OK, so I think we're over. Um, we can certainly stick around a little while longer for questions. But meanwhile, thank you for joining our session today. And please. Feel free to visit us in the Oracle booth. Thanks. Thanks.